My name's Toby Simpson and I'm the director of the Wiener Holocaust Library. I'm very proud to be introducing this film about our next exhibition, Death Marches, Evidence and Memory. When I first came to the Wiener Holocaust Library, I was using its collections as a student. And at that time, the library only had a small display case to show its amazing collections. Today, we have a wonderful building in Russell Square, London, where there's a reading room and a dedicated exhibition space. It's extremely exciting that this year will be the first year when the library will be showing its collections through exhibitions, not only in London, but also in Huddersfield at the Exhibition and Learning Centre created by the Holocaust Survivors Friendship Association. Welcome to the uh, exhibition, Death Marches, Evidence and Memory. I'm Dan Stone, I'm Professor of Modern History and Director of the Holocaust Research Institute at Royal Holloway University of London. Uh, and together with Dr. Christine Schmidt of the Wiener Holocaust Library, uh, we have co-curated this exhibition. Uh, the exhibition aims to illustrate uh, and uh, bring to light a little known aspect of uh, the Holocaust, that's to say the forced evacuations uh, which the concentration camp inmates themselves called death marches which took place at the very last stages of the war uh, as the uh, Allies, primarily the Red Army, were approaching the concentration camps. Uh, what we've tried to do in the exhibition is to show uh, not only uh, the roots of the death marches themselves but to show how after the war uh, the Allies responded to them uh, in terms of confronting local civilians uh, with the crimes committed by the Nazis, uh, trying to bring perpetrators to justice, uh, and to show how, uh, over the years, the death marches have been commemorated. The exhibition not only tells the history of the death marches, but also how evidence was gathered after the war and how history has been written about the death marches. Okay, so we begin the exhibition with a look at an overview of the death marches and what they were but we also include um, information about the types of evidence that was gathered to be able to understand uh, what happened. And we really want to show um, how we know what we know about the death marches with this exhibition. So for example, we start with a story of Eugene Black, who was born Jenny Schwarz, and who was deported um, in 1944 from Hungary to Auschwitz-Birkenau. He was selected for forced labor in Germany and was sent to uh, Mittelbaudora after being sent to Buchenwald and then survived several death marches. Um, and we include his story in the exhibition. Um, and he was eventually evacuated towards Bergen-Belsen. So we include images of, of um, the liberation of Bergen-Belsen, but also maps that were hand-drawn during the investigations after the war. And we want to show that the maps are only a partial uh, story of the death marches and the experience of the death marches. So we try to combine different types of evidence to provide a fuller history of the marches. I would say middle of March 1945, we were assembled, lined up, and we were marched to a place called Nordhausen, onto the railway line. Here again, the wagons were waiting for us. We were cramped in, the train set off. There was still snow. We were on that journey from one end of Germany right up to Hamburg for seven days. Every so often, which it must have been prearranged by the SS, the train would pull up and the doors would open and we had to throw the dead bodies out. And there were fellow prisoners outside picking them up, putting it onto cards. This section of the exhibition takes a thematic approach to the history of the death marches, looking first at the witnesses who encountered the death marches, moving into post-war confrontation and investigation of the death marches by the Allies. And then we move into war crimes trials where, by and large, perpetrators of the death marches were not tried. So in January 1945, there were about 714,000 concentration camp inmates, the majority of whom were forced on death marches, these forced evacuations from the camps uh, in the face of the advance of the Red Army. Trying to map 
those marches is extremely complicated and with this display we wanted to give a sense of the confusion and the complexity of the death marches but without it becoming uh, too incomprehensible. So we haven't shown everything here. There aren't, for example, uh, details of the marches to Bergen-Belsen, but we've chosen four examples from Buchenwald, Großrosen, Stutthof uh, and Auschwitz in order to demonstrate uh, how complex these marches were. There was not a single march, there were different uh, convoys of inmates left at different times. Sometimes the single convoys split and then rejoined again. Sometimes they were taken to a particular place, uh, such as uh, Mikov uh, or Gliwice, uh, and then put on trains to go further west. Sometimes they marched on foot uh, the whole way. So the aim here was simply to give a sense to viewers of uh, the death marches as a single phenomenon, uh, but breaking it down a little bit and to show how each individual uh, forced evacuation uh, was a very complex process. So in this section of the exhibition, Confrontation, we wanted to show what happened when the uh, death marches passed through the villages and towns of Germany. So we see on the, uh, the one hand how uh, local inhabitants uh, responded to the death marches, uh, most of all uh, by looking away but occasionally trying to help. Uh, but we also see what happened later when uh, particularly the American troops uh, came across sites where massacres had taken place uh, in various uh, places across Germany. So for example in uh, Neuenburg uh, they found many bodies uh, strewn around uh, and in the case and uh, on the photos we see uh, what happened uh, afterwards. The American soldiers forced the local German civilians uh, to exhume the bodies, uh, to build coffins for them uh, and to prepare them for a proper burial which was then conducted by uh, the American soldiers. We also see here uh, the response of some of the uh, Jewish displaced persons, the survivors, because in the uh, DP camps after the war the first uh, survivor accounts were taken, the first testimonies recorded uh, and in this uh, example from uh, Munich in 1947 in uh, von letzten which was the, uh, the journal uh, produced in one of the Munich uh, DP camps, uh, we see an account of uh, the death march from Buchenwald. So the survivors uh, spoke uh, when they could about the death marches uh, and produced the first accounts uh, which we have. So one of the things that we show here is uh, this photograph of an American soldier standing over the bodies of victims of one of the death marches uh, from Flossenburg, uh, bodies discovered uh, at Neuenburg vom Wald uh, in uh, Upper Bavaria. Uh, and one of the things that we debated was whether to show atrocity photographs in the exhibition or not. And so uh, we decided, uh, obviously, uh, that an exhibition about death marches couldn't go ahead without using some of these kinds of photographs. Uh, but we invite uh, visitors to the exhibition to consider the use of atrocity photographs and to think about the ethics of uh, reproducing images of dead bodies uh, as uh, a tool of historical research. We have examples of early projects to record survivor testimonies and to talk about their experiences. And it's actually not true that survivors weren't speaking about their experiences after the war. And we wanted to talk about how and to show that this was not true. So we've included examples of uh, testimonies and also images that show the physical devastation that survivors experienced um, on the death marches. This is an example of an account that was published in a newspaper by the Association of Persecutees of the Nazi Regime, or VBN in German. Um, and it was a, an account by a political prisoner named Henri Michel, which was published in 1947. So this is the um, backside of an image that we show on the uh, panel of Solomon Silverstein, who was a survivor of a death march. And he survived um, after being shot in the head um, and left for dead. And this picture was taken by the US Army Signal Corps in 1945. This group of images is a group of images of the Sepp sisters who were forced into a ghetto in 1939. And they were then sent to a subcamp of Grossrosen. They were evacuated on a death march and they both survived. Um, but this image shows uh, Fela Sepps in May 1945 in a field hospital in Volari and she died the day after this image was taken. So one of the things that the occupation authorities did uh, very soon after the end of the war was to order all the new uh, Bürgermeister or the mayors of villages and towns across Germany to supply them with information 
about where non-Germans had been killed or died in their vicinity. Uh, they had to file reports uh, to, uh, to the Allied authorities and they also provided cemetery maps showing where uh, non-Germans had been buried in local cemeteries. Most of them are uh, fairly straightforward drawings, but some of them, uh, as for example this one uh, on the uh, show from uh, a cemetery in Hanover, uh, are quite colourful uh, and have all sorts of uh, strange and curious details in them. Uh, this one in particular is, is rather uh, gruesome, showing the, the smoking chimneys in the background and, and other uh, curious details. Uh, so there are many of these sorts of maps in, uh, in the archives. The, uh, Allies established the Central Tracing Bureau, which is the body that later became the International Tracing Service. And one of the first things it did was to send workers out into the field to retrace the steps of the death marches. Uh, and they reproduced maps uh, such as this one uh, of the death march from Flossenburg, which shows in great detail uh, where the inmates of the concentration camp passed through. Uh, and they also tried on the way uh, through a program that they called the Graves Recheck Program to try and identify dead bodies. One of the things that's little known about is the extent to which former inmates of the camp uh, themselves tried to set up committees which would help people trace their relatives. Uh, the, the archives of these uh, bodies have since been absorbed into the International Tracing Service. But one of the most important was set up at Dachau by a former uh, Polish inmate called Walter Cieszlik, uh, who with a couple of other colleagues, for also former inmates, uh, established the International Information Office. And uh, for a couple of years after the war, uh, the records which they'd saved from the camp uh, were crucial in assisting people uh, find out about what had happened to their loved ones at Dachau. So this panel, we wanted to talk about ongoing research and commemoration of the death marches. And there's some really interesting examples that we wanted to show about how the death marches are commemorated, some through pilgrimages. So for example, we show a poster that was recreated by the March of the Living, wherein they recreate the death marches, but try to change the meaning of the march. Um, and you can see that there's this um, poster that's been uh, created for an exhibition that they did. Um, we also show the way historians and other researchers are conducting research on foot, um, uh, recreating the paths of the death marches. So we have examples of research that's being conducted um, and forensic evidence that's being gathered. Um, we also talk about the ways in which survivors themselves retraced the paths of the death marches. Um, in the case, we show a pamphlet that was created by two French survivors of the Flossenburg Tom death march, um, wherein in 1991, they followed the path that they had actually been on in which they survived. Um, and they took photographs of memorials and the lack of memorials along the way. And in this section, we show some of the innovative ways that historians and geographers are researching the death marches or the paths of the death marches. And this is a recognition that maps can only show us a, a bit of information about the paths that people took, but these representations talk about different ways to represent the experiences of people who survived on the death marches. And we close this panel with Ibi Knill's story. Um, she was also a survivor of the death marches, and this is in recognition that it's been a fairly recent phenomenon that historians and other scholars have incorporated survivor accounts in histories of the death marches. So they took the train away, and the following day, following evening, they started to march us towards Bergen-Belsen. And they marched us during the night time and hid us in barns in the daytime. Um, we could hear a lot of air raid activity going on around it, and every time that happened, in the dark, we were hidden. The daytime, they couldn't see us. After about three, four days, and I was getting the feeling, personally, that we were going around in circles. And anybody who had lagged behind, a soldier detached himself, and he just heard a shot, and the soldier came back, and the other person didn't. We're back on site, we're back at our exhibition and learning centre on the campus of the University of Huddersfield. And we've just finished installing Death Marches, the very first exhibition by the Holocaust and Genocide Research Partnership. As a founding member of the HGRP, um, we are especially proud of this project. Our collection, our exhibition and the Holocaust Survivors Friendship Association tell the history of the Holocaust from the perspective of a group of survivors and refugees 
who made their lives in the north of England uh, as members of local communities. As such, we are unique and in that we tell a global history via local stories. Everything that we do, from our learning program to the, uh, the development of our collection, to our exhibition, to our public activities, is underpinned by the experiences of this group of survivors and refugees who founded the uh, HSFA in the mid-90s. For them, the HSFA was a safe space where they could um, share their experiences of uh, the Nazi era and after. Eugene Black, E.B. Neal, John Schillag, uh, whose testimonies are uh, present in this exhibition just, just behind me, are also three of the founding members of uh, the HSFA. And this is uh, why uh, this ex exhibition for us feels, uh, feels so special. We look forward to welcoming you to the exhibition either in London or in Huddersfield as pandemic conditions permit. Thank you for watching.